When you start living with the end in mind, everything starts to change. What are people going to say about you? What message is your life going to speak when you're long gone? Because you weren't born by accident. You didn't just happen to be where you're at and happen to watch this video. There is always a reason. And uh, otherwise, let's do this thing. So welcome to the Fuse Life Podcast, episode number 17, where I have a different intro for every episode. <laughs> but you guys already know Fuse Life, we're all about passion, purpose, divine design, with an assignment that God has for you, and we're called to walk in it. And when you walk in that, you are truly fulfilled. And so today, my special guest, Tyler Frick, this is a man of many talents. When I first met him, Online, I didn't know his story because of how how I can't even reconcile the two. And um, it's going to be awesome listening to him today. Just We're just going deep, going raw, talking about random stuff, but not so random. So, Tyler, I just want to welcome you, man. Thank you so much for your time and coming on today. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, you're looking sharp. Your haircut's looking sharp as usual. Appreciate it. <laughs> so why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, just in terms of uh, what you're doing right now and your family, all that kind of stuff, travel, all that. Sure. Yeah. So um, a year ago, we launched a an online kingdom ministry and training school. And so we've been doing that for about a year, a little over a year now. And over that past year, God's really just, he's helped us just to reach thousands of people with, um, with kingdom teaching. And, but Recently, my wife and I uh, heard from the Lord that we got the approval to go ahead and sell our home and buy an RV. So we bought a Class A motor coach. Um, we've got three boys, but we sold our home. We actually had other properties too, and everything sold and was finished within two weeks. Um, and you know, in and out of contracts and things like that. And then we moved into the RV, and we are actually in Alabama now. So we were in Texas. Right now, we're in Alabama serving a community. Uh, in Rainsville with some pastor friends of ours, and um, life is good. We love it. We love what the Lord's doing with us. Wow. So how far have you traveled already? Uh, well, this trip, I think, was something like 800 miles uh, oh, to get here. It was about a 16, 17-hour drive for sure. It was fun. So you've picked up your family. Your whole family is going. Tell us a little bit, man. What's that like? you got young kids and your yeah. wife. How are they feeling about this? What's the deal? Well, funny enough, my wife's been begging me to do this for about five years. And so, um, <laughs> but I just hadn't, I didn't have the push, you know, she, she loves outdoors. She loves the country. Um, I've got all boys and my boys are all, they love just being out in the open, being out in the wild because they are wild. And so, <laughs> you know, for them, it's easy. And the RV that we got, the Lord really blessed us. It's really big. Um, it has plenty of bedding. So, you know, it's like I said, we, we enjoy it actually more than we enjoyed having a house. Um, and wow. so it's, you know, we wake up, we do life together, we homeschool our kids and, um, you know, it's, it's incredible. It's fun. That's amazing, man. So do you actually have a set plan? Do you, did you give your guys like, like say, did you give your family a year or two years to do this or are you just winging it? You're going with the Lord. Boom. So our thought was, let's do this um, for at least a couple of years okay. and see what okay. happens. And so, so far we've been, I think we've been in the RV now, maybe three months and um, we'll just see what the Lord does. You know, if, if I set a plan, what happens if the Holy Spirit changes it? Mm. What, what happens if he commissions me in a new way, you know? And so we're just kind of, we're kind of playing it, not by ear, but by the Spirit. Boom, play by the spirit. I like it. Wow, man, I felt that. Like that's play by the spirit. Come on. Yeah. In fact, um, so, so we we came to Alabama and the original plan was we would come, we did a some prophetic training a couple of times on Saturday, and then I preached Sunday morning and we had a prophetic worship night that night. And when I got done, I said, Lord, I don't want to really leave. This place is is great. And I and he's moving in this place. So I said, you know. I am just prayed that the Lord would give us direction. He told us to stay. So we've actually been here for three weeks now. And um, wow. we're going to stay as long as, as he tells us to stay. Uh, and then we'll go and do the next thing. But it's just day by day listening to him. Yeah. Wow. Boom. Okay. So 
Man, let's let's go into this a little bit into some of your past and how the heck you ended up here and what was the deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um I I grew up, I was raised mostly by my grandparents, um, you know, throughout my childhood. They were they were in church, they're believers, they love Jesus. Uh however, the specific type of church or theology or denomination that they're a part of um taught me a, more about religion than it did about Jesus and about relationship. Um, I didn't have really any scope for Holy Spirit, um, but I was I was raised up kind of in that in in that aspect of church. On the other side, my mother um, she was you know she did a lot of drugs and things, that, which it was good for us to be you know living with my grandparents. But what we would do is we would go and visit her on the weekends, and probably around age five, somewhere around somewhere around age five is the first time that. She showed me uh, what she did spiritually, and it wasn't um, it wasn't good, right? She would call up the dead, so she was a medium, and yeah. people would come over, and she would call up spirits and have conversations with the person and these spirits. Um, she actually thought she was doing it for God, but we know that she wasn't, right? And yeah. um, that's just not the way that he operates. It's not the way that he wants to reach his people. Um, but when when I saw it, I was like, I want I want to do some of this because I wanted something that was more spiritual, more powerful. And if she thought she was doing it for God, so did I. So I began kind of at that time um, doing those things. And, it you know, things progressed as I got older. By the time I was 15, I decided I wanted to move in with her. And so I moved in with her. And when I was 15, she gave me meth for the first time. Right. And so I'm doing these spiritual practices. I don't have a close relationship with God. I just know about a God, but not really even much about him. Um, mm. But I began to do drugs. I began to go deeper in spiritual practices. And that that kind of progressed. There was a little on and on and off throughout my high school, you know, because I was still going to school, playing sports, things like that. But when I wanted to be spiritual, when I wanted to do things that were um, that I felt were powerful, um, I would do things like astral project. I would, you know, put people into trances that wanted me to. And, um, put, you know, I would go into trances and different things like that, but more self-induced or um, induced spiritually, but not by the Holy Spirit. These were by mm. spirits and, and fallen angelic beings and things like that. Um, of course, I didn't know that was what was happening at the time. But mm. by the time I was 19, I had accumulated a lot of problems. One of these mm. were the mental health, right? I was mm. severely mm. depressed, um, constantly felt alone, constantly felt like people were literally out to get me. Um, spiritually, I was definitely demonically oppressed. I was in relationship with some angelic beings that were not holy, uh, that helped me to do the things I was doing on the spiritual side. And so when, when these things progressed, those, those, what I thought were spirits that were helping me turned on me and they would begin to speak like terrible things. I could hear spirits speaking through the walls uh, to me. You know, if I was in a hotel room, I would hear people in the other rooms talking about me, accusing me, just bashing me. And the reality was there may not have even been anyone in those rooms. I was being, I was hearing these spirits, but I thought they were people. And um, I came to a point when I was 19, I was, probably down to about 110 pounds, if that, mm, mm. and um, was still doing drugs. And I just broke, you know, I, I, I was done being depressed. I was done feeling alone. I was done being tortured, uh, you know, spiritually and mentally. And so I gave Jesus this ultimatum, right? Mm. I was like, if, if either you're going to show me that you're as powerful as these other spirits or more powerful, or I'm going to take my life because I'm not, I'm, I'm not enjoying this whole life thing right mm, and mm. it was in that moment that i i really just kind of broke and, and cried out to him he set me free joseph is what happened in that moment um the presence of god filled the room the power of god came on my on me physically i began to weep and um i probably cried my eyes out for probably about an hour and um when i got finished crying and all this stuff i got up and i hadn't realized what had happened to me but in that moment, I was set free from all the drug addictions. I was set mm. free from all the mental um, struggles that I was having with the depression and, and all those things. And then all the spiritual issues that I was having demonically or with these angelic beings, they were all gone. And mm. so I woke up and it was like, you know, the man in Mark 5 who was then seated and in his right mind. And I'm like, what just happened to me? 
And so from that moment, even until now, I've been on a journey to discover, number one, who is this Jesus that, mm. that is powerful, that is relational, you know, that is personal, and that can change everything for a person in a moment. And then secondly, if he did it for me, how can I help other people experience the freedom that, that I'm experiencing in that? And yeah. that kind of been the journey that led to what we do now, which is teaching people and ministering to people and just, just loving on people, um, teaching, teaching about the kingdom. You know, God didn't call us just to be religious. He didn't mm. call us to feel condemned if we weren't doing all of the right things. He's called mm. us to be, to know him. You know, Jesus mm. said in, in John 17 that eternal life is that we may know the father. And yeah. so I think that, you know, in Christian life, there's so many things we can go after, but the most important thing we can go after is knowing the Father. Mm. Wow, man, you hit everything there. That was so good. <clears throat> I want to go back into a little bit, little bit of this. Oh no, I lost mind. audio. Just now, lost audio. What about now? You hear me now? I don't. No now, now, now. Now? Seems like it's coming in and out. You know what? If you give me one second, I'm going to run and grab headphones and see if that'll help the problem. Okay. Yep. Is that good? Okay. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Okay, guys. Hopefully this is going to, the headphones going to work. I've only had problems with my podcast twice. And both times were when we were talking about really crazy stuff. So I do know that the devil's not happy about whatever's going on here. So if you can just cover this right now with your authority. Boom, we cover this podcast. It's going to be fine in Jesus' name. Also, let me know if you can hear me too. Hopefully you can hear me too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, tell me. We can hear you. I'm good. I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Boom. So I want to kind of touch on some of this because you went through so much stuff right there. Um, and one of the things that trips me out is that you said spirits were speaking to you from the walls. I had a crazy experience a month ago where I was in worship and I started to see myself running through an old house of mine. And I was running through the house killing all these demons, as funny as this might sound, like it still hasn't fully made sense to me, but I had a sword in my hand and they saw me and they ran because they were like, oh, dang, he can see us. And they started running. And then after I was like running with the sword, cutting all these demons out, and then I was in a wall. And when I went into the wall, there were these spirits in the wall like, oh, no, he can see us. It was a real trippy worship experience. And, I mean, this is one of the first times I'm sharing this, like – publicly I mean, it might sound loopy but it was so real like it was like i said that house free yeah. can you talk about that a little bit could that yeah could that I, be real? I, it can be real um one of the biggest things that i think hinders the church today is an absence of understanding about how things operate in the spiritual realm not only on the kingdom side and you know the things we want to go after but also on the on the side of the enemy you know, most people believe that demons and fallen angels are the same thing. And mm. the reality is, is that they aren't. Demons would be spirits without bodies. Um, so for them to, to hinder a person's life, they've actually got to be in the body. You know, to have a, a brain to cause those signals to, you know, fists to clench and express anger, a mouth to speak out. You know, that's how demons operate. But angelic beings have bodies of their own. They don't need a physical body, a human body to operate. You know, you've never mm -hmm. seen this concept uh, in scripture that you know, the archangel Michael then entered Peter and, you know, like that doesn't yeah, even yeah, make yeah, any yeah. sense, right? Um, yeah. The only spirit that we see that would enter a person would be the Holy Spirit, right? Um, mm. And then demonic spirits. But when it comes to spirits in our houses or around us, typically the ones that operate around us are going to be angelic. You know, Satan, it says that he's like a lion roaming around seeking whom he may devour. Um, and, you know, the, the reason that I think 
Christians should know about that is because the way that we deal with demonic spirits and the way we deal with angelic spirits uh, is different. You know, mm. for, for demons, we've seen Jesus would cast them out. We see that he gave the disciples um, permission and, and jurisdiction to carry the, the authority of his name and command demons to come out. But then we see in first Corinthians, or let's see, Ephesians 6, where Paul mm. is teaching about, you know, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers and principalities and, and all these things. If you were to break down what each of those mean, there's all, actually mm. only one of those. And I think it's the dark forces or wickedness in heavenly places, right? There's only mm. one of them that, you know, could include demons, but most of the other ones, it's talking about angelic beings. Mm. And, you know, there's a huge perspective here uh, that we can take from Matthew chapter four. Uh, Satan took Jesus to an exceedingly high mountain. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And then he said, hey, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of this. You know, the word teaches that that the world is right now subject to the prince of the power of the air. Um, it also mm. mentions the God of this world, right? Being Satan. And mm. angelic beings, they're after glory. Uh, the, the best way to understand glory would be property, wealth, you know, goods, uh, relationships is a huge one. And so... Sometimes people, they feel like maybe they're under a demonic attack. And the reality is, is that they're under angelic attack. There, mm. There's angelic beings trying to war against their relationships, against their property, against their businesses, against all these things. And if we were just to look at any kind of unclean spirit as being the same um, mm. and think we just deal with them the same, then it's in that ignorance or, or even just yeah, it's, it's just ignorance. You know, we don't we don't have the knowledge. So in that, we may try to war and say, we cast you out and we do all this stuff and nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Paul taught that the way that we be angelic warfare is by standing. It's about mm -hmm. putting on the, the the armor, which is, you know, the principles that it's it's faith. You know, the shield of faith, it's, it's salvation. It's the breastplate of righteousness. It's the belt of truth. Mm -hmm. You know, you look mm -hmm. at each of those faith, righteousness, truth. These are things that have more to do with our understanding and our heart posture than do, you know, yelling and fighting and all that stuff. And so he says, put on all this armor and then stand. Mm -hmm. And for some believers, there could be angelic beings around their house, around mm -hmm. their family, around their businesses, around their property. What we need to learn to do is identify what are they going after? What's mm -hmm. the goal of these spirits and how can we stand against them in faith? righteousness and truth so mm. yes so, so in the in the dream or the vision that you had where you saw this um it's possible that the lord was showing you that he's going to give you authority and begin to reveal to you how to take out the this type of warfare that doesn't just happen in the body but can mm. even happen around our bodies and in our atmospheres wow so here's a question shilpa yeah. asks then where did demons come from yeah. Oh, I see it popped up there. Awesome question. Um, so I've studied this lots of lots of hours, lots of time. Um, tracked a lot of late great ministers, uh, like people like Derek Prince, people like Kenneth Hagin, you know, those kind of guys. And from what I can tell, and this is this is my belief, I would encourage anyone who really wants to know the answer to that question to study this out for yourself. But what I personally believe um, is that you know we see in in Jude it mentions that there were angelic beings that fell with Satan, right? And there's a certain sect of those fallen angels that fell who in Genesis 6 says that these fallen angels went into the daughters of men and created an offspring, right? Mm. Um, we can look in the scriptures and see that that offspring, they were giants. Uh, it calls them men of renown. When, when those beings were created, they weren't part of God's original design. So instead of God taking dust of the earth and the breath of the spirit and putting them together and creating a being like he did with humans, this is an angelic being taking a physical human, bringing them together to create an offspring that was somewhat of a hybrid, if you will, mm. um, that God didn't create himself. It wasn't in his plan. Mm. When those beings died off, their spirits didn't, they don't have a place in heaven. They don't really have a place on, you know, in Sheol or Hades or any of that. But Jesus said, when a spirit goes out, it walks aimlessly seeking to find rest. 
demons are bound to the earth. And so what I believe is that demons are the spirits of those beings that were created. Some might call, you know, spirits of the Nephilim or of the giants, but just in, to keep it practical, it's the spirits of those beings that weren't created by God, but were a hybrid uh, created by fallen angels and mm. man. So because they are roaming the earth awaiting judgment, th- from the time they came out of those bodies until the day when Jesus deals with all of that, um, mm. these things are roaming around looking for bodies. When they're not in a body, they're not at rest. Uh, mm. Whereas angelic beings, again, they don't need bodies because they have mm. angelic bodies of their own. In fact, an mm. angelic body is probably more capable than a human body. So why mm. would they want to get in a human body that would limit their ability to manifest this or that, right? Does that make yeah. Sense? Yep, yep. Wow. There you go. <clears throat> Chilpa, that should have answered your question. We got one more thing here. I just feel to touch on this. Sheila says, I won't go into my art room. It has something wicked in there. Most of the time it's contained in there. And later on she says she has some kind of fear. I don't know if, um, I don't know what you want to do about that. Tyler, you want to break something off right there? I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, we could. So the thing is that Jesus says all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and I'm giving it to you. He told his disciples, therefore, go into all the world, make disciples, preach the kingdom. Um, part of preaching the kingdom is dealing with the enemy. It said that, you know, one of the, one of the reasons, right? I think the Bible just says the reason that God brought Jesus, the Son of Man, into the world was to destroy the work of the devil, Right. And we know we get that when he died on the cross, he destroyed the work of sin. But it's even deeper than that. When we walk in that authority that Christ gave us and when we're quickened by his spirit, we have authority, all authority in heaven and on earth because of his name and because of who he is to deal with things like that. Um, If this is a if I had an angelic being that was in my art room, right, what I would do is I would say, Lord, what is this thing here for? Mm. The first thing you want to do is understand why is it there? Number Mm. one, what is it? Number two, why is it there? Um, Somebody who may not be very aware of what it feels like when an angel of the Lord is in the room or when a a holy angel is in the room um, might think, hey, I'm sensing some kind of presence here. It must be bad and we cast it out. But I I would just say that there's and and this sounds it, it feels wicked in there. That's a good sign that is probably wicked. But mm. oftentimes there can be an angel of the Lord or a ministering spirit that wants to give you insight about creativity and about art. Mm. So, so it being in that art room wouldn't surprise me if it was holy. But if this is wicked, um, just find out what is the goal here? What do you do mm. with your art? Do you sell your art? Do you um, create things that bring breakthrough into people's lives when they look at it? Of course, the enemy would want to snuff out any opportunity for you to take glory, right? So if you find out what it is, the Lord will reveal that to you. The Bible says, Mm. if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask the Father who gives generously without reproach, right? So ask the Father, get the download of why is this thing even here? And then the way I deal with it is I say, you know, in the name of Jesus, number one, I charge you guilty, for being here, for trying to hinder mm. the Lord. And secondly, I command you to abandon your assignment against me and, be, and I command you to leave the region. Mm. You know, we have, we have authority to do all of those things. Um, but it does, and this brings up another big point. I hear a lot of times where people say, well, I just rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. Mm. Saying that does nothing. Mm. Mm. Because saying you rebuke is like saying, I'm praying to the Lord. Mm. But are you actually praying? Mm. You, you know what I'm saying? So to say, yep. I rebuke you doesn't actually do anything. So yes. rebuke means to charge guilty. So you've got to actually mm. find a legality to charge this this spirit with. If the legality mm. is trying to hinder art and hinder you know, God's movement on the earth through you, then charge the enemy guilty for tampering with the glory of God. Charge the enemy mm. guilty for trying to hinder the purpose of of, of your faith on the earth. And by charging that enemy guilty, not only is that brought before the courts of heaven, but it's also dealt with in an actual rebuke. One mm. of the things I hear a lot of people say um, is, you know, why would we ever try to rebuke 
an angelic being if even the archangel Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. But I'm just mm. saying to tell you, you've got more authority than the archangel Michael. You carry yeah, the, of the king of kings and Lord of lords. You carry, if you're a believer, you carry the authority of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Who mm. is not subject to that? Mm. And why would you mm. be hindered? Why would you be fearful of dealing with something when Jesus said this? And, and I'll just bust open another funny thing here. Jesus took Peter um, and in Caesarea Philippi. There was a mountain. I, I believe it was called Mount Orb, but I, I could be wrong. There was a mountain there. He walks Jesus, or, or Jesus walks Peter over to this mountain in, in Caesarea Philippi. And he says, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Right? Mm. The literal location Jesus was standing with Peter when he said that was in the midst of shrines. There were three main shrines that were built at this place. It's a physical location called the gates of hell. In the Old mm. Testament, you can find it. It's at the mountain, or it's, it's a, at the base of this mountain. It was a cave, and they couldn't see the end of the cave. So it was known as the gates of hell. And mm. people, you know, Greeks there who would worship false gods had built these altars and shrines to false gods, literally at the mouth of this mountain, at the mouth of this cave called the gates of hell. And Jesus mm. takes Peter there and he says, upon this rock, in other words, on this specific location, I'm going to build my church in the midst mm. of idol worship, in the midst of worship of false gods. A false god, all it is, is a fallen angel. Mm. People, people may see it as the sun god or this, you know, whatever god, but really it's a fallen angel manipulating mm. people's faith, manipulating people's beliefs. And Jesus said the church will set up shop not where it's comfortable, but where mm. idol worship is present. And so for us to be the church, for us to live out the principles of the kingdom and to walk in the integrity and the authority and the power of Jesus means that we're not afraid to deal with the enemy. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And if we're sent and we carry his anointing, why would we not do the same for ourselves, for our families, for our friends, for their businesses, for, you know, all of these things. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Cool. Oh, man. Look, Tyler's a teacher. <laughs> and this <Yeah>. can get deep. <laughs> um, and that's why he's got his courses. For those of you that you're like, man, I want to learn this. I need to know this. The links in the description. Go check out what he's doing at the King's Company. It's awesome. And um, but we've jumped so many subjects. I kind of, and that's totally fine. It's awesome. But um, I had this picture that I wanted to share with people. This old picture, and uh, yeah. I want to do that right now. I want to do that right now because so that you can see where Tyler has actually come from. All right, here is this picture. Can you guys see this? Tyler, tell us a little bit about your days Well, and, like this. In this specific picture, I was probably, I was either 17, I think I was either 17 or 18. I think it was 18 when I took mm. this picture. I had to go get my license renewed. Um, I was, I looked like a skeleton. Like mm. you can, you can see my eyes. I don't see life in those eyes. Mm. I don't, I don't see hope in those eyes. Mm. Um, that's rough, right? But, yeah. but that's literally, that's a picture of me when I was 18 um, in the midst of my spiritual and mental chaos and in the midst of not being in relationship with the Father, trying to pursue temporary fixes to my soulish needs, not knowing that mm. Jesus could correct all of them in a moment. Yeah, man. So I'm just trying to get this down here. What's your weight in that picture? Maybe 115. 115. My weight now is one. 195, I think. 195. Okay, wait, wait. I want to go back to this and just keep this here because all the stuff that you did, the drugs that you took would have affected your mind, correct? Oh, for sure. And yet you are here teaching. Yeah. S sound mind. You're mm -hmm. sharp. Did you ever have anything that kind of slowed you down and messed you up back then, but that you noticed like that left you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, one of the things that hinders an in in increase of understanding is insecurity. 
Mm. You know, when, when people are living insecure, mm. and insecurity can look like a lot of different things. There could be knowledge-based insecurity where we feel like, I'm not real sure what I believe. Or, mm. you know, even if I know what I believe, I'm not real sure how accurate it is, right? That's yeah. a knowledge-based insecurity. But even personal insecurities, timidity, fear, shyness, you know, not really feeling like you have a voice, not really feeling confident, mm. those type of things, mm. um, those type of insecurities will limit you from gaining understanding. Because the Lord said, in the last days, knowledge shall increase. But if we're walking mm. around saying, well, I'm not real sure, and we think that it's going to take 20 years to process something that God could teach you in a moment, um, mm. it's going to be hard to learn. Yeah. So what, what, what happened for me is when, when Jesus set me free, he removed a lot of insecurities. And by mm. removing insecurities, there was, there was new access to gain understanding. And because I have a, a love for the voice of the Father, and because I have a trust in the voice of the Father, number one, mm. it removes insecurities. But number two, when he speaks, I can believe him because mm. he's faithful and he doesn't lie. And there, there is no lying with God. So mm. I, I would say the biggest thing that, that I felt shift was going from having so many insecurities to being free to grow and free to understand and free to be confident in what I, what I know. Yeah. Wow. And I just want to share this picture of obviously Tyler now with his beautiful family. That's his wife, Brianna, and his three kids. Look at them. They are wild, man. They're going to be amazing in the kingdom. Well, they probably already are. <laughs> Those boys are. Right? Yeah, you're a blessed man. And I just wanted to show people this just because I think sometimes, like you might have people in your life that look like the, the old Tyler and you might see no hope. Well, now you can see hope. This is a complete flip around. Like no community project program can do this kind of transformation. <laughs> you know? Like no psychologist can put someone on a couch and flip the script like this. Like this is, this is a massive miracle, man. Cause now there is a new lineage. The whole old cycle has been broken. A new one's formed. And now not just Tyler and his wife, but his three kids. It's, it's, um, it's massive what happened. Awesome. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to share that. I think that's I agree. Amazing. I'm in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Okay, man. Well, I mean, really, what do you want to talk about now from here? True transformation. <laughs> like, what is true transformation? Before we even go there, I know you're a young man. Like, how old are you now? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Okay, so I'm I'm like six years older. Make me feel even older, but. You're a young man, you're, you're, you're on fire, you're carrying this revelation, this ability to teach, you're wanting to push boundaries, you're wanting to, you're a pioneer, you want to delve into stuff that hasn't been touched. This must have caused some issues with leadership, people around you, all that kind of stuff. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the biggest things, and we, we can kind of stay on the same topic of, of demonic and angelic warfare. Mm. When, when I was in relationship with those spirits, they were having their way, right? Mm. When Jesus set me free from those things, um, their warfare strategy shifted. And the thing is, is that we still have to wear the armor of God because warfare is not going to stop. You know, one of the things I really honor in life is prophetic, you know, the prophetic word. And every time I receive a prophetic word, the enemy's got to change his strategy. Because now yeah. another piece of my purpose, another piece of my destiny has been released. So when spirits come and try to invade my life, but don't have any access in, mm. it doesn't mean that people won't recognize a spiritual issue around me. Does that make mm. sense? So mm -hmm. although I could be free, I could be whole, I could be, you know, just, just ready to do, you know, healthy and ready to do good things. I can show up to a new location with other leaders, other people who've never met me. And those, those beings do not want me to have influence there. Right. Mm -hmm. So how, how hard is it for an angelic being who's not in my body? How hard is it for that thing to go over and whisper in somebody's ear? Who's not really paying very good attention and doesn't recognize mm -hmm. what's influencing them to say he's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Right or he's insecure, or he's this, or he's that. 
that's one thing. The other one is that discernment, right? People can mm. discern that there's a spiritual issue in the room, mm. but it may not be in a person. Mm. It could be around the person trying everything it's got, giving it everything it's got to get influence in this person's life. Mm. But the person can still be walking in purity, can still be walking mm. in wholeness. However, because of the presence of the warfare that people carry, people are going to pick up on that. People who, especially mm. in, in a culture where people want to be more spiritually sensitive, you know, that that's the same with you, man. You carry, you've mm. got crazy purpose, crazy destiny on your life. When you travel, when you go in places, the mm. enemy is going to do whatever he can to shut that down, right? And mm. Or try. Mm. And sometimes people might pick up on, I don't know, there's something about Joseph that just doesn't feel right. Mm. But in mm. reality, it has nothing to do with your heart. It has nothing to do with mm. who you are, how you're being developed mm. by the Lord. It has everything mm. to do with the amount of warfare that surrounds you. Mm. It's trying to take you out. Wow. Interesting. So what is your solution to that? What, what do you think can break that off or solve this problem? Um, well, so the warfare is going to persist. It's going to increase. Yeah. Well, one, one time the Lord took me into a vision. So I'm a seer. Um, I see a lot of things. One time the Lord took me into a vision. Um, he took me into the second heaven. And I saw these mountains that were, you know, a typical, a normal mountain. It looks like this, right? Well, these mountains were upside down. So the peaks were at the bottom and they were mm. mounted to the what would be like the ceiling of second heaven. Mm. And I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, these are mountains of influence that belong mm. to the enemy, the realm, you know, the enemy, right? Different enemies. Mm. Mm. And they mounted themselves to the ceiling of second heaven because they don't have access to the third in the way that they mm. like, but they want to be as close to the, to the, their original purpose and, and as close to the glory of God as they can. So they were mounted to the bottom and all of a sudden I began to see pieces falling off and falling to the mm. ground. Boom, boom, boom. The entire mountains began to crumble and fall, and they're falling to the ground. And I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, does my word not say that Jesus is going to come back in the same way that he ascended, that he'll descend mm -hmm. in the same way that he ascended? I said, yes. He said, well, how did he ascend? And I said, well, when, they, when Jesus ascended, he passed through the heavens, right? Mm -hmm. So when he returns, he's going to pass through the heavens and everything Every being, every idea, every concept, every every everything is going to be put into subjection under his feet. And he's coming on the clouds. And mm -hmm. if you look outside, clouds are maybe a couple hundred feet up. Mm -hmm. So imagine all warfare, all things being compressed, even in the spiritual realm. As the Lord returns, it's, it's all being compressed. Warfare is being compressed within a couple hundred feet on the earth. Because mm. it's coming on the clouds. And the Lord showed mm. me this. I said, what, what is this about? And he said, and it was what, it was before I wrote my book, Heart of Conviction. And he said, it's the conviction in people's hearts that's going to be most prevalent in this hour because warfare will increase. Mm. You'll, you'll finish one battle and mm. four more armies are coming after you. You'll finish mm. those and eight more are coming after you because mm. time is running out for the enemy and he knows it, right? Mm. So... Mm. I, I can't sit here and say, hey, you can get rid of all warfare in your life. What mm. I can say is that if you'll learn to listen to the convictions of Holy Spirit and really mm. begin to tune in the difference between his voice and a holy angel's voice mm. or a demon's voice, a fallen angel's voice, if you can begin to discern and understand who's who, mm. what's influencing you, it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit telling you, hey, go this way and go that way. Don't do mm. this. Don't do that, right? And being able to listen to those small words, it's not just going to help us in things like prophetic evangelism, right? It's not just going to, yeah. but but the conviction of the Holy Spirit will help to keep us holy, keep us pure, and keep our hearts clean before God as we walk on the earth. That's my, yeah. that my first main answer, is that the best way to combat warfare is to increase conversation with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And then would you say increasing healthy conversation between humans is, is an important thing? You know? <laughs> so, um, so the thing is, there's two Greek words, right, that have a lot of significance. One is the word for father. The other is the mm. word for mother. The word father means one who infuses his 
uh, spirit into his own offspring for the purpose of actuating and governing the mind. Wow. So, so when we were adopted, it's a spirit of adoption because we receive a new father. No longer are we fathered by the enemy as mm. bastard children on the earth, but we receive mm. a spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And we begin mm. to have our minds governed and actuated by a new spirit, by a new father. However, the word for mother, which is M-A-T-E-R, uh, mater, the word for mother means the one who manages, nourishes, and develops the appetite. Jesus mm. said this. They said, look, it's your mother and your brothers. He says, those who seek to do the will of my father are my mother, my sister, mm. and my brothers. If we were to look deeper into that, he says, those who seek to do the will of the father are the ones who nourish, develop, and manage appetites on the earth. Wow. So, wow. so when we're in community with kingdom people, having good conversations, learning mm -hmm. how to love people well together and not isolated, mm -hmm. what it does is it actually nourishes, it manages, and it helps us develop our appetites for what is good, what is right, what is holy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. without that, then we're being fathered, but we're not being mothered. And that's mm -hmm. the importance of community. Community is what nourishes us. It, it's what helps us develop healthy things in our lives. So absolutely. Mm. Mm. Wow. I do. I talked about this with Matt yesterday, but in, in my nation, at least in New Zealand, it feels like there are 50, 55 year old and above men that I've connected with that really have a heart to pass on to the next generation. And then it seems like there's a young generation, maybe under 25, under 30, that are like, yeah, let's go get it. But there's this gap of like, don't know how to relate. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I don't want to generalize or, you know, I'm just saying what I've seen, like a, it's a fact. And um, it's intriguing to me what you're saying, because I think the ability to talk things out is so valuable and totally underused in, in churches or in Christianity. Would you say that's right, or what's your opinion on that? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely under, underutilized. You know, the, the wisdom of the old with the zeal of the young, um, there's a merging there that needs to happen, and it's happening very slowly. Um, I, I think there's ways that we can do better with that, but it's, it's going to start with every person, every believer, regardless of what age you are, um, making a decision to have those conversations. And to not stray away from them. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's unhealthy fathering. There's yeah, unhealthy yeah. authority. Um, yeah. But in the kingdom, there's also very healthy ways of being yeah. fathered, being mothered and, um, and then being as children, right? So the kingdom of God belongs to the children of God. So regardless of age, we've got to be willing to listen. And mm. it may be somebody who's older that's fathering you, but mm. because you're a child in the kingdom and age is irrelevant, you might be mm. the 55-year-old man being fathered by Joseph, who's mm. whatever age, mm. right? Mm. Um, and so what we've got to be open to is listening for the heart of the father in any mm. voice, in mm. any age group, um, because that's what's really going to develop us. Mm. Wow. So let's hit this thing of true transformation, man. Like what, what is true transformation to you? And what have you seen that we people have tried and not worked and then where it's actually worked like a real transformation? Yeah. Um, so what doesn't work is fighting for an anointing that you already carry. And what mm. does work is walking out the anointing that you already carry. Um, so there's, mm. there's this idea in a lot of Christian circles that there are some people who are highly anointed. Um, and then there are others who are laity. Right. Um, mm. Not they don't you know, maybe they don't carry a lot of influence or they're not a minister. Or they're not a pastor. Things like that. Right. Um, it's hogwash. It's nonsense. It's foolishness for any believer to think that some people are anointed, but some people. Mm. Um, mm. The reality is, is that when any person comes into the kingdom, they receive the anointing of Christ. We can see that in. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 through 20. No, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Uh, mm. We see that all believers are anointed and all believers mm. are filled with the Holy Spirit. We also see in 1 John chapter 2, 
where it says that, you know, you have no need for a teacher for the anointing of Christ shall teach you all mm. things. Mm. Um, and that that's something that everyone has access to. That's we right. Yep. To, you know, when we come into the into the kingdom, we are anointed as mm. he was anointed to do the things mm. that he did. Um, mm. Jesus prayed for that. He asked the Lord for that. He beseeched the Lord for that in John 17 in his prayer. Um, you know, he said, the same things that you've given me, the same glory you put on me, I ask that you give it to them, that they might know mm. you, because eternal life mm. is to know you. And, you know, so so when when believers are striving to obtain something more than what was already given to them, it's always going to leave them lacking because mm. the, the principle is flawed from the very beginning. The root of the whole pursuit is flawed. True transformation comes when you recognize, look, all things have already become new. You know, um, when, a, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, if the caterpillar, like the caterpillar was a caterpillar. Those things, they, they literally feed the passions of their flesh. They stuff themselves full of leaves until they're so fat that they can hardly move. Then they build a cocoon around themselves, and then the Lord transforms them, right? Mm. So. But how many butterflies are out there in the kingdom right now thinking they're still a caterpillar when they have wings? And mm. and maybe they're looking, they're just sitting on a leaf going, man, I don't know how I'm going to eat this now because I don't have the same chompers I used to. And yeah. it says, look, I've, I've transformed you to seek after nectar. Mm. And and so th- just to be metaphorical there, there's, there's so many believers who have stepped into the kingdom by faith. They believe that Jesus is Lord. Um, they called mm. on his name, but now they're trying to earn a, maybe a title. Maybe they're trying yeah. to earn a status. Maybe they're trying to earn a reputation. Uh, mm. When the reality is, is none of that matters. You're already anointed. Now mm. let's walk in it. Mm. And so I think I think transformation has a lot to do with that. Um, mm. Understanding that you've already been transformed. Mm. And that nothing can take that away. Nothing can hinder that. Mm. And so what's what's your first step you tell someone who's like, okay, I've been I've been born again, I received Jesus, I don't feel like I'm flying like a butterfly. Mm-hmm. What does Tyler say to them? Uh, I would have them reach on their face and grab the muzzle and rip it off. Mm. Jesus, you remember the, the guy in, in Mark five, he had a legion of demons in him, right? Mm. And um Jesus casts out what is it, 2,000, 6,000 demons? There's the mm-hmm. theological debate. It's a lot of demons, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and the guy's seated in his right mind, and he says, Jesus, let me go with you. I want to go with you. And he said, no, I want you to go back into this town where the people were, are scared of you, have kicked you out, rejected you, like you were busting chains open with your bare hands. Go back into that city and tell them what I've done for you. Mm. Where was the discipleship training? Where was his mm. theology school? Where was his seminary? Mm. Where was his qualification? Let me tell you where his qualification was. It was because he was completely transformed in a moment and commissioned mm. to go and tell people about it. Mm. Any, any believer who comes with the same thing. So, so my encouragement to anyone watching this is if you're a believer, remove your muzzle because you do have a voice in the kingdom and it's time to begin releasing it. One of the best wow. ways to do that can be telling your testimony testifying mm. that this is already done for you. Um, mm. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be mm. deeper things. It can be, you know, being willing to just sit down and have a conversation with somebody and talk about how life can be better, you know. Mm. Um, but but never to think, hey, I'm not qualified or I'm not educated enough to make a difference. Mm. Wow, man, that should set a lot of people free right there. Well, boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <clears throat> I mean, I'm conscious here, like we could get into some subjects and it will get into deep teaching. But um, what 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 is on your heart right now to share? I mean, I know you're a prophetic guy and you can feel things, sense things, and you're a seer. We've got about 21 people on here right now. What are you feeling? What what do you what's in your heart? Oh man, that's a good question. I can I, I can listen. I think that the biggest thing is is that the Lord just wants to identify himself on the earth. Mm. You know, the Lord wants to make himself known on the earth and he's going to do that through us. Mm. Um, you know, we can, we can sit around waiting for revival. It's not going to bring revival. Mm. We can look for what God's doing in places on the earth. 
that's not important. You know, um, there's so many people who, who love to look at where God is pouring out places, right? I don't believe God's going to pour out his spirit in huge revivals in places. I feel like he's going to do it in people. In the mm. Old Testament, God would highlight places, locations, mm. and he would bless them, right? Mm. And he would pour out in places. And we've seen him do things in, you know, Toronto or Brownsville yeah. or, or different revivals like that. And those are powerful times. Yeah. But I believe God wants to pour his spirit out on people. Um, there's a there's a verse that when it comes to the prophetic, a lot of people have heard this verse. It's Amos 3, 7. It says that God does no new thing without first revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. Mm. Um, and we might think that that's like God's going to give a revelatory download of what he's about to do in a, in a region. And mm. then that prophet can prophesy it. But if you look into what the word secret means there, it actually means a secret assembly, a company of people. So mm. God will do no new thing without first revealing his heart for a people to his servants, the prophets. Um, mm. if I, and if I could, if I could encourage even prophetically anybody to step into something that the Lord wants to do, um, just recognize it's not really about the place; it's about the people. Mm. You know, us being those people for one, but also the people in your region. You know, mm. if you want to start pour out in your region, you've got to start loving on people. Mm. You know, it's not about how hard can we fast and pray and intercede that God would just do all the work for us. It's about how committed will we be to having daily conversations with people we know need it. You mm -hmm. know, deliverance is, is ready to be poured out, you know, poured mm -hmm. out all over the, the earth. But what we've got to do is have a conversation with people who are broken. Mm -hmm. How long do you want to be stuck? How long do you want to be depressed? Um, can I pray for you? Can I teach you? Can I disciple you? You know, and that that's what I believe. So I would say just encourage people, just to listen, listen to the Lord. What does he want to do in the people that surround you? That can be your, your marriage. That can be your family. That can be your church. Um, but it could also be the people you work with. What does God want to do there? And how can you be a good steward of, of seeing those things come about? Yeah. And that's simple in many ways. Yeah. Simplicity. Wow. The gospel, the kingdom is so easy, even a child can understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Hey, if you guys got any questions, you can throw them up here. It's already nearly been an hour. It's gone pretty quick. Um, but like I've said before, this is just first of many. We're going to have many conversations probably about some more controversial subjects too. <laughs> but hey, you know that scripture you just mentioned in Amos and um, that he does nothing before revealing it to his prophets. And then um, there is a scripture in the New Testament. I don't know where exactly it is, but it talks about how in the old days he spoke through his prophets, but in the new days, oh, well, in these days or last days, he would speak through his son. You know that scripture? Mm -hmm. How does that reconcile those two there? Like, well, what's your interpretation of that? Yeah, well, we've kind of actually briefly hit on it. First John mm. chapter 2, when it talks about the anointing, teach you all things. Mm, mm, mm. Um, every person in the kingdom has that anointing, right? Mm. Every person in the kingdom carries Christ's anointing. That's Some people are like, you know, look at that brother so-and-so's anointing. Like, no, <laughs> I don't, you don't want other people's anointings and That's right. you want Christ, right? So, yeah. but it says that his anointing will teach you all things. So mm. when in the Old Testament, God would release his words through prophets over people. In the mm. New Testament, he releases it through the church to the unbelievers, right? The prophetic brings the unbelievers in. And, mm. you know, because he's poured his spirit out on all flesh in Acts chapter two, and because he's given his anointing to the church, all we've got to do is be willing to listen to what the mm. Lord, the son teaches our hearts, and then release that. If we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus says, I only say what I hear the Father saying, I only do what I see the Father doing. For mm -hmm. us, we can say, I only say what I hear Jesus, the Son, speaking to me, and mm -hmm. I only do what he leads me to do. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's cool because John chapter 20, verse 22, says that Jesus breathed on each of his disciples. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure they did in that moment. 
But that mm. was 10 days before the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. Mm. So, so there's a difference between what Jesus breathed out onto his disciples and then what the Father poured out 10 days later after they waited patiently in Jerusalem and expectantly in Jerusalem. Um, and that's what we have. The one Jesus breathed out, I believe, was his anointing. You know? mm. And what the Holy Spirit poured out was his presence, was his power, his grace. Mm. Um, and so when we have both of those, we have the opportunity to walk in both of those. The, the Lord will speak to the nations through his son when the church is willing to open our mouths and declare what it is we hear. Mm. Come on, Facebook, don't do this. Oh, yeah, I'm back. Can you see me? You're back. Yep, I see okay. you. So um, that question there, can you see that question? How do you boldly step out into what God has for you? Yeah. Um, so let's see if you're frozen again. No, no, okay. Okay. How do you boldly step out in what God has when you know you have a spiritual target on your back? Um, put three more on your arms and three more on each of your legs as well. Recognize you are a target and walk as a mm. target. You are created to destroy the works of the devil every day. So light yourself up like a firecracker and let the enemy see you everywhere you go. Your target should be huge and you should enjoy wearing that target because it means you're taking territory. Now, on this whole thing with history of sin for the enemy to bring a light to and discredit you, take it to the courts of God and say, Father, I accept guilty charges for every accusation, every, every sin I've committed. I'm guilty. I accept that. Would you please give me a righteous judgment? And the Father is going to look at the Son. He's going to see the blood of the cross. And he's going to say, mercy. Bam! <laughs> Come on! So, so your history of sin is irrelevant to, mm. to today's assignment. Your history of sin and, and anything the enemy would use to discredit you is irrelevant to your obedience because, of course, the enemy would accuse you. He accuses the brethren day and night before the Father in the courts of heaven. Are you guilty? Yeah. Fine. Say guilty. See, judgment's yeah. not scary when you know your judgment is mercy. Yeah. And the Lord's yep. going to empower you because he sees you as Jesus. When God looks at you, it's because of the sacrifice of Christ that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He's cast it into a sea of forgetfulness, and it literally doesn't even come up. Come on. There you go, Brian. Boom. Walk it out, brother. Walk it out. We'll get another question here. Shilpa, what is that question? Can you talk a little bit more about the prophetic role and how people who carry certain spirits may avoid them? Or is that even a thing? Um, talk about prophetic role and how people who carry certain spirits may avoid them. Maybe I don't understand the question. I, I don't quite understand the question. We can that too. Maybe she's saying if some people have a spirit and they have a prophetic role, but there's something not quite right, how do you avoid them or what, what happens like if they prophesy over you? And Yeah, um, just listen for the Father. You know, and mm. no prophet spoke on his own accord, but all were carried about as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance. So if you're familiar with the voice of God, then you'll recognize his voice in people. Um, the, it's like, it's like Joseph, if you were in a big room, uh, there was a hundred people in there and you walked out because you needed to go to your car. And all of a sudden you heard your name being called by your wife in that room. Mm. You recognize it because you're mm. familiar with it and you'd run in there, sure. and, you know, what, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody else called your name, it might be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get something out of the car. I'll be back in a minute. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's a different voice. The more familiar yeah. we become with the Holy Spirit and, and with the identity and character of God, the more you're going to be able mm -hmm. to recognize it uh, in other people. Um, when, when it comes to walking in the prophetic and wondering, like, if people who have certain types of spirits are going to come and try to take you out, like this whole thing about a Jezebel. My biggest thing is, don't worry about that. Mm. That's none of your concern. It's literally none of your business who's out to get you. Mm. Just walk mm. in what God's telling you to do. Um, being so focused on the enemy while you're trying to minister will only distract you and depress your ability to speak. Um, it, it'll cause you to have fear of man or fear of what others may say. So if that if that was part of the question, um, then just, just walk in what God... God gave you. 
you know, he, he protects you, he seals you. So you're mm. good. Are you good to answer some of these questions? Is that Absolutely. good? Absolutely. Okay. So Storm says, how, how do you address the Masonic? We have one in our town and it's close to the church in the city. Is that a principality, stronghold? She's very aware of it. Okay. Um, there are, we're talking about like Masonry, Freemason and all that. Yes. Yeah. So Freemasonry is rooted in, um, it's actually, it's like a mockery, but it's an abomination to the Lord because if you get to the, you know, and you can, you can find this information, but like at the highest, highest rank of Freemasonry, um, there's a, there's a good, there's like a God, right. That there, that is worship. And it's called, um, let me think. It's, it's Ja Ru Bell, I think like that. Ja Ru mm. Bell. And mm. the, when you look at, at the word itself for that God, it takes Jehovah, right? Which is our, our God. And then it takes another God that I think, I don't remember if it's Osiris or, or something, but it's another God. And then it has Baal. And so when, when this God's being worshiped, it's saying, hey, we're combining our God with these two other gods, and this is one thing that we're doing. So it's actually a, um, it's a twisting of, of the Trinity, really, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, saying that we're going to use the power of God alongside, you know, alongside the, the power of these fallen angels and these, or these false gods, or gods, what we call false gods. And um, the way you combat it is through knowledge-based reasoning. Um, typically, the reason people would want to stay involved with something like that is because they believe something or have knowledge of something um, that intrigues them. You know, if it's a demon that's teaching the knowledge, then you can cast the demon out, but the person will still have um, an understanding thing to fix. So on this, it's not about, you know, going and blowing your shofar on the steps of the masonry building. It's not about walking around at seven times praying in tongues, unless the Lord were just to tell you to do something like that, then of course do it. Um, but for this, it's be willing to have a conversation with people. You know, if, if you know somebody who's a Mason, have a conversation with them. And your conversation is not based on arguing. Your conversation is, is based on uh, helping them gain new understanding. And then of course, praying for people, you know, um, and then as believers in your region, Forgive, ask for forgiveness and forgive them, you know, uh, repent on behalf of the people in your region, even if you're not guilty. You know, God's been known to spare entire cities and entire regions because of the repentance of one righteous. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There you go, Storm. Boom. Well, those are the only two questions we had at the moment, but... Um, we got to do this again, man, and go deeper into certain specific subjects, you know? Yeah, would love to. Tyler, you are the man. <laughs> I think you're the man, Just. Uh -huh. Oh, they, these uh, Masons come to her church, which is awesome. Yeah. So you can facilitate conversation. One of my clients is a Freemason, and we have very awesome discussions about it. <laughs> um, but I love it, man. I love it. Look. Um, I think we wrap today here and we come back with specific subjects, maybe a series on some of this. I don't know. I will talk to Tyler and see how we can best create something that can bring the most value um, and actually bring the most transformation because that's his heart. That's my heart. And I know our hearts is actually to mobilize people and deploy them, not just fill them up with stuff that's never used. You know, there is um, a real heart here to, to actually see the world shift. And that can't happen if we're not deployed. So I just want to thank you, man, Tyler. Thank you so much for your time, for your heart, the prices you've paid, for the willingness to obey God and just do the stuff. And I love you, bro. You're the man. Yeah, you too, man. Awesome. Thanks, And for um, yeah. Hey, when, whenever we wrap up a podcast, I get people to share their one-liner, their wisdom quote or a bomb, one bomb. A sentence that you're holding close to you this season, what would that be? Um, the most detrimental result of pride in the life of a believer is the absence of prayer. Mm. Can you, you gotta say that again? Yeah, the, that was good. The most detrimental result of pride in the life of a believer is the absence of prayer. 
Wow. Lack of prayer, presence of pride. Sorry. That that's a <clears throat> a sober bomb. <laughs> that's a sober bomb. Well, there you go, guys. Prayer life, man. It is the secret. It's the not so secret secret. So thank you guys for joining us. Hope you had an awesome time. We're going to be doing this again, so keep a lookout. And I've got more guests coming on even tomorrow. We've got Mary with Jerry, episode number two. So make sure you tune into that. But I want to th thank you all for coming. Tyler, you can stay on here. But everybody else, love you guys. Have an awesome day, awesome evening, awesome weekend. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. Patience means allow it to happen. Stay the same. Stay persistent. Keep going. Faith, know that it can happen at any moment. Get excited because it can happen at any moment. You are so close. Don't quit now. Keep pushing. You got this.